What a joy. What a joy to worship the Lord with you guys. And just um, thank you for being here and for connecting with it. Um, there's just something about when uh, God's people just worship passionately the Lord. Uh, something just happens in our midst. And I, I just, I don't know why, I felt like last week, I felt like it was the, it was the breaking and we're like entered into this season of celebration. And um, I certainly feel like that's continued this morning. Um, we are going to uh, continue through our series today. Um, I wonder if I could use that board. Would, would someone be willing to help me out and erase that off of there, and pull those papers off, and then um, bring the board over? I might use that in a little bit. If I don't, I apologize for making you do all that for nothing. <coughs> do we have markers too? There must be markers somewhere. Okay, cool. All right, so while they're doing that, don't be distracted too much. Jim, can you click on the PowerPoint for me? It doesn't seem to want to go. And are we recording? You good? Beautiful. You're the man. Look at these guys. Look at the speed, the efficiency. Um, if it doesn't erase for a while, it's okay. I, I just use the top. It's a good verse anyway. I feel like this is us, you guys. This is just our church in a nutshell right here. Did you know six years ago there were 12 people? I mean, that's where we started. 12 people on the second floor of my state farm building downtown. Uh, we, had, we fixed it up, uh, kind of. Uh, those of you that were there on the first day that we had a service will remember um, there was no carpet yet, and we, but we had ripped out all the old carpet, and so it was, um, it was like a full-on construction zone. And it was like from the first day, I, I could barely play guitar at that point, um, from the first day, from the first chord, it was just like Holy Spirit just descended on us, and something happened in that building on that day. I can just remember crying, just happy tears. And I remember the first day, is Peach here? She's not here. Maybe she's upstairs, or maybe she's not here today. But I remember we played the first chord of How Deep the Father's Love, and I just cried. I just cried through the whole song, the whole thing. And um, we prayed over our city that day, and we had no idea what summer serve was going to be. We had no idea of anything. We were just 12 broken people that showed up and decided that we were going to um, serve the Lord. You know what works is Windex. If there's Windex in there, we can clean it. Oh, <laughs> seriously, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We'll get it after. It's not a big deal. I'll use the top. It's, I, there are plenty of room. But yeah, that's what God has done all of this um, from that. And so now um, I know we don't have as many today because of the snow probably, and that's okay, um, but no big deal. We're just going to be here, and we're going to seek the Lord together anyways. Amen? Okay, we have the board. That was my time wasting there. Thank you. Can we just enter to enter into the enter into the throne room one more time, just in prayer, just prepare our hearts. Lord, as we just go into your word this morning, I pray that you would just pour out on us again. Lord, we thank you for what you've done already this morning. My heart just leaps for what you're doing in the people of this church, that you're working on us, that you're changing us, that you're making us into an army to do your will, to spread your word, to pour out your glory on this community and the communities around us. God, we thank you for the victory that's been won already. And Lord, that you'd bring about that victory in our lives just a little bit more this morning. Help us to be who you want us to be, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The nine-week challenge uh, we've been going through. This is the halfway point already. Can you believe that? Um, what I wanted to do is start off this morning. This is, uh, these are a bunch of statistics. These are true statistics. There's one characteristic in a household that can cause all of these things to happen. I don't want you to say it out loud if you know it. I just want you to be quiet for a moment. Um, we just want to think about this for a second. This one characteristic in a household will lead to these things for the children. 
four times the greater risk of poverty, seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teenager. 85% of children um, with this characteristic in the household have behavioral issues. 90% of the homeless and runaway youth in our nation come from a household with this single characteristic. 63% of teen suicides come from a household with this characteristic. Double the risk of infant mortality, double the risk ending up in prison, double the risk of dropping out in school. We're talking huge, huge numbers here. Does anyone have a guess of what might be the cause of all of those things? Kevin? Broken marriage. Broken marriage. Fatherless. I thought someone would say drug use, addiction, all of those kinds of things. Those things pale in comparison to children who have no father in the home. That is stunning, stunning news. And yet, if we look at what we focus on as a nation, if we look at what we focus on as a people, do we focus on solving this problem? Or do we try to just solve all of the symptoms? Symptoms, right? It's like a microcosm of our healthcare system, which drives me absolutely insane. We go in, we tell them our symptoms, they treat our symptoms. We don't get to the root causes most of the time because there's no money to be made in solving the problem. I don't know if that's the actual motivation or if it's just easier or if the way that our laws are written just make it more that way. I'm not sure. But we don't seem to want to solve the problem. We just want to help the symptom. Well, these symptoms will never go away if we don't solve the problem. And so what we want to talk about today, a little bit different. I don't know if I've ever even broached this subject before on a total basis, but um, we're going to give it a go. Uh, It is going to be about uh, families or biblical families. And so I want to go through and share some of my struggles, share some of the things that I've dealt with, um, because I have, uh, yeah, I failed in a lot of ways. Uh, Let me just put it that way, failed in a whole lot of ways. Uh, But hopefully, I can impart to you some things from Scripture and some things from my life that you won't have to go through some of the same things that I've had to go through. Amen? Amen. You with me? I had a dream last night. I, I never dream, normally. I never dream. This is two weeks in a row I've had a dream that I felt like directly related to the sermon after I sat down and thought about it. This was my dream. Some of you who know me will know that this to be true. I was working on, well, on a big ladder. I hate, hate ladders, and I always end up on the ladder somehow. Always end up on the ladder. Why? Why does this happen? Normally, it's because I'm the smallest. Like I can get into a tight space, I'm the one who climbs. Um, Or I'm the only one willing, uh, whatever it might be. But I end up on these high places. Well, I was there in my dream, and I got up on this roof. It felt like it was my roof. It didn't look like my roof, but it felt like it. And it was like a reversed, um, I don't know what, what you'd call it. Like a barn goes like this, right? But this roof went like this, like it got steeper up to the peak. And so I was just like gutting it out. Don't look down. I just climbed all the way up to the top. Bless you. Climbed all the way up to the top and I straddled the top, the peak of the roof and I got up there and I started working and I was doing my work and I didn't realize what time it was. And all of a sudden I finished what I was doing and I looked up and it was dusk. It was going to get dark and I could see it was a cloudy day. There were no stars, no moon, and I was going to be stuck on this roof in the dark. And then I looked down and in my dream, I was just paralyzed I knew I had friends working. It felt like a summer serve. There were like friends working elsewhere, and they were all finishing up their jobs and cleaning up their stuff. And I knew that I could call out for help, but I like couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do it. It was like I was prideful. I was like, I got myself up here. I can get down. But I was like trapped. And then the wind started, and I could see the ladder like moving back and forth. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm going to be trapped up here all night. be trapped up here all night. And then I woke up. (laughs) I don't know how that dream ends. I probably died. The Lord spared me from it. I'll talk a little bit more about what I think that means at the end of the sermon, but um, just wanted to start with that. Man, isn't it powerful how God can give you such a picture in your mind and just take you right to that place? I can just feel it all again, like my heart's racing right now, thinking about being on that roof. 
My hands are starting to sweat. I'm a cold-handed person, and my hands are sweating right now. Ugh. Anyways, totally unrelated, feels unrelated at least, the first family. God created us to be in family. Amen? Amen. We're not supposed to go through this thing alone. And after God created Adam, he, we went back and he said that to us. Or he said that to Adam. He said, it is not good for man to be alone. You remember that? He says that to Adam in the garden. And so this is what happens after that. The Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. He says, I'm going to make a helper, not just, not just any helper, okay? He goes through, Adam goes through all the animals. He names all the animals, and there was no animal found fit to be Adam's helper, not even man's best friend. Like you picture, he goes, the golden retrievers there, okay? He comes up to Adam, and you think, wow, this is the perfect, perfect sidekick for Adam, and, but it's not. It's just not the right fit. He needs something more. He needs something better, even than man's best friend. Adam didn't like cats, by the way. Um, Genesis chapter 3, that was for you, Krista. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, then the man said, at last, this is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh, because God puts Adam to sleep. He takes out one of his ribs, creates woman from his side. Why from his side, do you think? Oh, man, that's like heresy in the church, isn't it? He doesn't create from the head, right, to lord over him. He doesn't create from the feet to be trampled by him. He creates from the side that he would have a partner, a helpmate, a sidekick, an equal. Amen. Perfect answer. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. She is the first sidekick, absolutely. Adam is the first superhero, and she is the first sidekick. He was. He couldn't be killed, right? He was invincible. He had, but he just had one kryptonite. Stinking apple. Or fruit, whatever it was. We don't know what it was. Then what happens in the first family? She took of the fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And so we had this beautiful picture. God creates this perfect sidekick for Adam, his helpmate, the one that was fit for him, according to the word. And where does the enemy attack? Her. Attack the relationship, attacks the first family right off the bat. The nakedness. We talk about that and it kind of like makes us awkward to talk about that they were naked and not ashamed. And I'm like, well, we have no shame in Jesus Christ, right? So next Sunday, everybody, no, don't do that. <laughs> Jesus ain't brought me that far yet, okay? <laughs> and I hope he ain't brought you that far yet either. But what's, Yeah. That's a nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. That's a whole different dream, isn't it? <clears throat> you ever had that dream? Yeah, I've had that dream too. <laughs> this nakedness was not about not wearing clothes. This is about intimacy. This is about no shame at all. This is about complete openness in our relationship with one another. It's kind of like when I was first saved, okay, when I first realized my sin, I felt like I was naked before God. And just the shame and the guilt and all of the burden of all of the things that were laid before me that I was just, I couldn't hide anywhere anymore. I couldn't cover any of myself anymore. I felt like I had to turn to him. Like I had to cry out for salvation. I had no other choice. The shame was too much because I'm not comfortable being naked. And I'm not saying being naked without clothes. I'm saying being naked of the soul, being laid bare in front of everyone. And so the enemy attacks there. And now they feel shame. And so you have that beautiful, perfect intimacy, this perfect openness, all of those things. And now 
you have this shame, this guilt, this now tension in the relationship. Now we need to hide ourselves from each other. What a tragedy. And then they had kids, and the enemy doesn't stop attacking, does he? They have child one and child two, and this is what happens between child one and child two. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? <coughs> yes. You should be your brother's keeper. That's how family is supposed to work, right? right? We're laid bare before each other. We have each other's back. When we struggle, we lift each other up. When we're down, we help each other. That's how family is supposed to work, but the enemy attacks there. And from this verse, we see... God says, the enemy is crouching at the door and his desire is to have you. His desire is to devour you. And so I think the enemy's primary function, if we look at all the statistics, all of the havoc that's wreaked in the world, I think one of his primary functions is to attack the biblical model of families that the Bible lays out for us. And so what I want to do today is hopefully show you a little bit in the Word and hopefully rebuke a couple of the lies of the world uh, that we might be able to um, fight back using the Scripture, that we might be able to fight back and um, support people in the ways that they need to be supported in their relationships, that our families in Katanning and that our families in this nation might become stronger. Amen? Okay. This is one of the most... <clears throat> pervasive lies of our culture. I see this all the time on Facebook, and I've actually started to rebuke it, even among unbelievers. Um, can anyone guess what it is? <clears throat> it has to do with um, families and the order of families. It has to do with kids, actually, specifically. Anyone ever see this lie? I see this all the time. All the time. This makes me absolutely crazy because this lie right here sounds so good. Doesn't it sound right? I mean, you read it and you think, man, that is so right. Of course my kids come first. They are, the, they are like my little precious gems. How could I let anything happen to them? They need to come before everything else. And I've actually, whenever I see this post now, you'll see my comment, if we're friends with the same friends, you'll see my comment right below, your kids come third. Your kids come third. Third. I will look my kids dead in the face <laughs> and say, you are not the most important thing in the world to me. You are third at best. I love you with all of my heart, but I will not let you steal away my top two relationships. Never. Never. Who comes first? God. That's where we started this series, right? Yeah, yeah. God comes first. It starts with love. It starts with this love relationship with the Father. If we don't have that right, nothing else goes right. Amen. Who comes second? Your spouse. Yes. Your spouse. My wife comes before, before all the other kids combined. And God comes before every single one of them. If we could get that right, if we could just get that right as a nation, it would change everything. Amen. If we could convince people, no, God comes first, your spouse comes second, the kids come third. Well, what if I don't have a spouse? Well, your kids might come second. Boyfriend doesn't come before them. Because we see that's a big problem too. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Dogs then kids. <laughs> yeah. That's why I said third at best, Kevin. That's why I said third at best. That's a joke. That is a joke. The rest was not a joke. This is the other part of it, okay? Um, I learned this a, a, long, a long time ago. Um, I kind of added to it a little bit. This is a wheel. I'm not a very good um, artist, okay? So bear with me. So this is my life. My life is this wheel, and i got to fit these things in there. Okay, i got to fit in God, my personal relationship with Him. 
I got to fit in work. I have to fit in my family. I believe in all of my heart that, I, I, that we're not supposed to operate in our life without the church, so I got to fit in that somewhere. Um, sorry, I split up a couple things here. Yeah, I got to have other healthy relationships. Anyone else just need some friends sometimes? You got to get away from the family. You get make each other a little crazy. Yeah. Is that ever? Okay, me too. Okay, I'm just making sure we're on the same page. What else is really important? I have one other thing that's really important for me that I don't do very well. Can anyone guess what that is? Yeah. Rest. <laughs> Y'all know me. So a few years ago, um, sweet little baby Joanna was born. And at that point, I was still very young in my uh, state farm office, and I had a real problem because this is what my life looked like. It was two pieces, okay? It was church, and it was work. And if I wasn't working, I was doing church stuff. And if I wasn't doing church stuff, I was working. What happened was... Um, we started this great thing called Summer Serve. And I decided to start it when my wife was eight and a half months pregnant. That was so smart. <laughs> and I decided that that summer I was going to lead all 12 projects. And you know what else I decided? I was going to do a 13-week sermon series, and I was going to preach every single week. That was so smart. Um, just the wisdom of the Lord was upon me. Um, no, it was really foolish. And it, it drove me into maybe the worst um, six months of my life. Um, after Joanna was born and she came home, you, you, if you guys have had kids, you know what that's like. The infant stage and trying to work your way through that is um, it's difficult. And it's real difficult uh, when you're just one person, and that's my wife, because I wasn't there. Um, I was at work, or I was doing church stuff, and my wife's at home with two kids under the age of three years old trying to hold it all together. And I'm trying to desperately do what I can in the few free hours that I had in between. Um, I ended up in a full-on, in, in retrospect, I didn't realize at the time, I went into full-on adrenal fatigue. I was just running on pure adrenaline, and I went into a deep depression. Um, I don't think the church suffered a whole lot during that time because I was pouring out a lot of effort into it. Um, I know, but I know I suffered internally. Outwardly, probably many of you didn't even know I was going through it because if you would have, you probably would have saved me from myself. But that's where I was at. The real, real negative side of that is I remember all of my kids' young, young years, young months, like first year of their life. Like I can remember what it was like when Abby was born. I can remember all those things. I can remember when it was Lily was born. And I have a lot of great memories of Mal when Malachi was born because I've been making videos ever since he was born, okay? So I documented all of his life. But I don't remember a single moment. I don't have a single memory of the first six months of Joanna's life. I don't remember being at the doctor. I don't remember being at the hospital. I don't remember her as a baby. I don't remember anything. That's how deep I was. We can't neglect these pieces of the pie and expect to succeed. You have to rebalance. And if, you, if you're... If you think you might be out of balance today, I would just encourage you, write down these six words, draw the pie on a piece of paper, and do an honest assessment. Where am I? Now, I was at the point, at that point, where I didn't, you know, I could, I was even operating as a preacher in the church without having a strong relationship with God. And that really hurt me over the course of time. That really hurt me over the course of time because then you're pouring out of an empty vessel. And after you do that for so long, you're done. And so it took me, once you get to that place of adrenal fatigue, you can look it up medically, 
um, basically you have a six month reset period. It takes that long for your body just to bring back the chemicals into balance. And so not only did I lose the six months, but I lost another six months. It's starting to make sense now, isn't it? Royal Family Kids Camp, starting to make a lot of sense, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And if that's where you're at, then it's time to adjust a couple things. And so I had to literally start building rest days in and dates with my wife in. And I had to build in time with God. And I had to build in time with my family to try to bring this pie back into balance somehow. But that's how the enemy will try to attack your family. Because are any of those other things not important? They're all incredibly important. I was running around doing so many good things. I was. But I was, the enemy was using good things to ruin the other good things in my life. Make sense? Okay. So what's a biblical family supposed to look like? I'm just going to give you a few scriptures. I know we worshiped a long time, and I make no apologies for that whatsoever. Um, but I want to um, just give you a few scriptures, and then we'll, um, we'll finish up. Oh, please, computer, work with me. There we go. Okay. So this is where we're at then. Because Jesus came to restore, right? Jesus came to set all the things right. What the enemy tried to steal away. I mean, I love that song. What the enemy meant for evil, he's turned it for good. He's turned it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. So here we are, Ephesians chapter 5. This is what a husband and wife relationship is supposed to look like. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And that's it. Let's go home. Perfect, right? (laughs) For the husband is the head of the wife. I love teaching this stuff. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Submit in everything to their husbands. But there's more. Husbands, this is our part now, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself as splendor, in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves him. He who loves his wife loves himself. And so we have this beautiful picture, right? Women, submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. Is it like this terrible thing for the church to submit to Christ? No? Some of you hesitated a little too long on that. Is it a terrible thing for the church to submit to the will of Jesus Christ? No, it's great. Why? Because God, yes, exactly. Because Jesus loves us with unimaginable love. Jesus always has our best interest in mind. Jesus is never out to harm you. He is only for you and not against you. And so it's not bad for us to submit to Jesus because Jesus is always out for our good. And so husbands, that's your job is to be always out for your wife's good. It might be short-term pain like sometimes it is with Jesus, right? We can make a decision that causes short-term pain but long-term It's going to be a good decision. And as a husband, sometimes we have to make those hard decisions or we make them together with our wives. And that's okay. That's a good thing. And husbands, is there any greater love than to lay down one's life for their friend? No. That's what Jesus said. Jesus told us. The greatest love is to lay down one's life for their friend. And so husbands, we should be laying down our lives for our wives. That we might present her. cleansed by the washing of the water of the word that he might present her to the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We should love our wives with everything that we are. 
And so how can we restore? Like if you feel like you're in a dry place in your marriage, you feel like you're in a, a weird place with your relationship, um, this is like, um, this is going to sound wrong, but you got to get naked with your spouse again. <laughs> I'm surprised I only got one amen. I mean that in the least sexual way I can possibly mean it. There needs to be a, an openness in your relationship with your spouse. Don't hide things anymore. Make time. Communicate. Remember how you talked when you first dated and you were so enamored with all the stupid little things in each other's lives? You got to get back to that place. That's how I know when my wife and I are in a bad place in our marriage is when we start treating each other like business partners. Very transactional. Yeah, I'll do that for you. I'll do, or... Or once you get to the point of, I did that for you, now you owe me this. Oh man, you're in a real bad place if you get to that place. Either way, okay? This could be husband or wife. This is a two-way street. How I know that we've gotten back to a good place is when we go on a date and we'll start talking transactionally when we get to that place where we make a, some stupid joke about something really silly about the other one and we both laugh. I know then we've, we've gotten back to where we started. And you have to fight to get to the back to that place. You have to return to your first love. You have to do the things you did in the beginning. Now these are biblical principles out of Revelation that God speaks about his relationship with us, that if we want to fire our love for him, then we need to go back to our first love and do the things that we did in the beginning. But those same principles apply to your spouse. Go back and be silly again. Go back and be naked again. Bear your soul. Love them. <laughs> be good, Kevin. <laughs> what about our children? Sorry, uh, this is the rest of the man one. I I'll read that to you. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Um, fantastic book. comes right out of that last verse, Love and Respect. Um, if you've never read that book as a couple, buy it like yesterday. Um, one of the best 15 bucks you'll ever spend as a couple. If you can walk through that, that'll create so many conversations. If you're stuck in your re marriage relationship, um, start reading that and talk about it after you read it. Oh my goodness. You'll have some all-out brawls, and you'll have some tears, and you'll have some repentance, and God will do a work. I can guarantee it. Amen? Amen. Well, all right. What about the children? Teach them. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? All of those scriptures out of Deuteronomy um, that you've got to teach your children, that you have to constantly be remembering all these verses. I'm just realizing that this did not save my most recent Word document, so I'm going to go right off the cuff here. Um, Proverbs 22.6, train up the child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, this is a really interesting scripture. Uh, I just... I had to look up this week, and I went, to, uh, I went to the word train up. I wanted to see what that word actually was. It was this word. I don't, did I put it in here? No, I did not. Um, it was chanak. Um, sometimes the Hebrew words have that throaty sound. It was chanak. And it was to train or to dedicate or to inaugurate. What was really interesting about it is uh, it was only used four times in the Old Testament, this, this word. And so whenever I see that, I immediately think, wow, it must be really specific uh, meaning for something. And it doesn't even feel like train up when you read the other parts of this. Um, the word uh, where it's most prevalent was in the temple, okay? Um, you remember when the Solomon built the temple? 
Uh, let me look it up here real quick. I'm going to read right out of here for a second. 1 Kings chapter 8. Man, we're going to be late today. Sorry. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's house and the people of Israel before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is in Zion. And so we see here Solomon, um, he built the temple. Uh, they spent what, what is assumed to be billions of dollars in today's money to build this most lavish temple that ever existed on the face of the earth. Solomon was the richest man in the world at the time. Solomon was, was Bill Gates of today, and he decides he's going to build a temple to the Lord. Can you imagine what it would look like if Bill Gates decided that he was going to build a temple to the Lord? It would be lavish. It would be amazing. It would be the greatest thing you ever saw. That's what the temple was. And so Solomon, he invites all these people from around Jerusalem. They bring up the Ark of the Covenant out of the city of David. The men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels in the tent. And the priests and the Levites brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Now they count and number them at the end. So evidently someone was counting and numbering them. So we see at the end, maybe they just saw how many were missing when they were done. They came up with the verse, uh, verse later on it says, they sacrificed 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep on a single day to kind of dedicate this temple. That word that they use at the end here, let me get the actual scripture for you. Verse 63 says this, yeah, Solomon offered as a peace offering to the Lord 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. That word dedicated is the same word that's used here. Translated train up. We see it in 1 Kings. We see it in 2 Chronicles. This Solomon dedicating, dedicating the house of the Lord, sacrificing 142,000 animals. Can you imagine the blood? Oh my goodness. And that's how he, that's the word that he uses to say, train up your children. I don't know if that speaks to anyone else, but that speaks to me. That speaks of sacrifice for the training up of your children. If I'm going to dedicate them, it's going to cost me something. If I'm going to train up my children, it's going to cost me something. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's how we need to approach the training up of our children, as if we're sacrificing unto the Lord. I don't know. I'm just going to leave that at that. A couple other things. Invite your kids into your struggles. They don't need to know every detail. You got you to bring this to an age-appropriate level, okay? Like I'm not going to talk about some things with my five-year-old, okay? There's some lines there that probably need to be um, drawn. But at the same token, if dad's having a bad day and dad's been a little bit cranky, it's a really good thing for you to go to your kids and to, to explain to them, look, there's no justification for the way that I've been acting. I am sorry. I'm really sorry. I got pulled away. These are all the things that happened to me, but here's how I should have reacted to that. And then lastly, you got to bring G Jesus. You got to point to Jesus at every step. And all of those negative things that happen that you can have this conversation with your child, you don't ever want to show them that you're perfect. You want them to know that you're not. And you want them to know that the only hope that you have is through the blood of Jesus Christ. That will give them such hope. They know at a very young age that they're not perfect. I can give my kids, and we've done this at Kids Jam, give them just the simplest of all gospel presentations. Every single kid knows that they're a sinner. I've never found one that said that they weren't. They know who they are. They need to know that they're not alone. That's our job. We've got to give them the hope that we found.
through Jesus Christ. That openness, that nakedness. We need that to be a mark of our life. You don't need to have all the answers. You don't need to have all the answers. I think so many times we struggle having these conversations with just young people in general because we feel like we have to have all the answers. You don't. You just need to be close with the one that does. And that's Jesus. And if you can just point to him, continually point to him, continually point to him, that's going to have a greater impact. Bible study with your children is so powerful, not just for you, but for both, or for not just for them, but for you. <laughs> I love, love, love reading the Bible with my kids because they ask the most elementary, befuddling questions. It sharpens me. It's like iron sharpening iron, having Bible study with your kids. Or like, I don't know, it, not iron, maybe like a rusty blade sharpening iron or something. I don't know what the correct illustration would be. But man, it's powerful. You will experience God in a different way. It's like reading the Bible with anybody else. Like if you've ever been in a small group and you go through the Bible together and all of a sudden someone brings out your point and you're like, where did that come from? That's amazing. That happens with my kids, with a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, three-year-old or four-year-old and a two-year-old. Study with someone who knows nothing. It's one of the best ways to grow as a Christian. <laughs> and your kids all start there. Some of you might be saying today, um, well, I don't have any of those things. My spouse is gone. My kids are grown. I'm not in that situation. Paul speaks to people that are alone. And um, I would say to you, what a blessing. What an opportunity. If you don't have to worry about one of the pieces of this pie, it makes the other pieces a little bit bigger. You can spend more time with the Lord. You can spend more time cultivating other relationships. Maybe you decide, well, I really want to pour into kids, but I don't have any kids around me. I'm going to start coming to Kids Jam and volunteering. I'm going to start coming to the youth group and start volunteering. And guess what? God's going to give you a voice into some young people's lives. And man, you connect with them on Facebook Messenger or whatever, they'll be talking your ear off. I guarantee it. And you'll have opportunities to pour into their life that you never thought possible. <laughs> so you failed. Now what? Anyone else feel like that? Like, man, I just failed my kids. I failed my spouse. I failed, man, I just failed. So this is my story. This is my song. <laughs> Today's a new day. I feel like I never read my Bible with my kids. I never gave them that opportunity. I never, I never felt comfortable with that. I never start today. Start today. I never talked about God with my kids all that much. I was never all that comfortable. Well, today when you drive over that bridge or you drive along the river to go home or whatever you do, talk with them about Jesus. Look at outside and look at how beautiful it is and talk about how you think God created all that. How do you think it ended up like this, that God like, made all these things happen? Why do you think our city is the way that it is? All these conversations lead right back to the Lord, yep. if you're willing to let it. Yep. One of my favorite times with my kids, we go out in the garden, and we'll go out and work our tails off. We will get sweaty and dirty and gross, and it's beautiful. I love working in the garden. My kids are playing in the mud. I dig up. I have this broad fork. It digs up like this huge section of ground all at once. And they sit there, and it's the race between the kids and the chickens. Who can grab the worms the fastest? <laughs> but it doesn't take too long before they grab something. They grab a flower, or they grab one of those silly little worms, and it's wiggling around in their hands, and they'll go, God, why did, Dad, why does the worm move like that? How does it do that? Guess what? That's a conversation about God. 
because I can explain to them everything I know scientifically about how all that works, and then I can explain to them how scientists have no idea still how all that life happens. Because God did it. Because God created that. And what's the real blessing is now, I've had so many of those conversations with Abby. I'll hear them over there playing, and they'll pick up a flower, and they'll do that, and Abby will go, God made that flower, Joey. Did you know that? And it just makes my tears come to my eyes. Because you see it happen. It's like a million little steps. Your relationship's broken with your wife. You've been mad at your husband for six months. Start to repair it today. It may not happen overnight, but it'll never happen if you don't start today. Take him out for ice cream. Go do something stupid you used to do. You used to go up to Buttermilk Falls and sit on that one rock and watch the water go by. Go there today. Go there today and watch the water go by. It's not too cold for your wife, okay, AJ? Back to the dream. Remember the dream in the beginning? I was stuck on that rooftop. Straddled it, watching the sun go down, and I know that I'm not getting that ladder. I thought about afterward, what could I have done different? And I thought, I didn't want to get down because I, I was going to look, I knew I would look scared in front of everybody else. It wasn't so much that I thought I'd get hurt or anything like that, but I didn't want the, my appearances to be negative in front of everybody else. You got to get over that fear. You have to make yourself vulnerable. What if you fall and fail? What if you end up hurt? What if it's safer just to stay where I am? It's not. The enemy wants, you, wants to lie to you and keep you in the place that you are right now. But faith can make you take a step and another step and another step. Here's the other thing. I had friends all around that would help me. I had friends all around that would help me. Can I get an amen? Amen. When I saw that ladder shaking in the wind, I could have easily called someone over and said, hey, can you hold this for me? If I just get over my embarrassment, get over my pride, and just ask for a little bit of help, it can look that way in marriage too. Say, I don't know what to do with my wife. Well, find another man in this church that you see that has pretty good marriage. Start talking to them. It'll go well for you. They'll have some good ideas for you. They might sympathize with you a little bit, which will help you. And they might knock you upside the head a little bit, which you probably need. (laughs) Call some friends. There's no shame in that. You're not in this thing alone. We're in this thing together. Listen, it's only daytime for so long. There's only so much time for action and repairing relationships and all of these things. And I can tell you, and some of the older people here could tell you even better than I could, 10 years goes by in a blink. You don't want to go 10 more years with a broken marriage. You don't want to go 20 more years without a relationship with your kids that God honors. Because if you get too far down the road, at some point it's too late. That was the message from that dream. I saw the sun going down. I knew pretty soon I wouldn't be able to see the ladder. And I'd have no way out. You got to go today. You got to go now. God wants our families to be in a certain way, to be in a certain order. If this has spoken to you at all today, if you see any of these things out of order in your life, start making it right today. I know, trust me, that this is not a simple turn. It took me a long time to fix these things. You know why? How I got in this mess in the first place was because at work, I was doing everything. I had to start to delegate. Luke will tell you, I don't do anything now. (laughs) 
you got to delegate around. What happened to church? I was doing, I was doing everything. So I had to start to delegate. You had to start to build a team around you. I wasn't really doing everything, okay, at either place. But I felt that way. And I needed to offload some of that stuff in order to make space for the other things. Not all of you are as um, blessed as me to be able to make those changes even. Some of you might take six months to start to offload one little thing here and there to make that couple hours for your wife and your kids. Offload that one thing here or there to make that day of rest. Offload one thing here or there. But you can do it. I promise you can do it. And you'll be blessed when you do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I pray over this congregation this morning, God, that you would, that I, I just pray that you have spoken something that goes deep, deep, deep in our hearts. Lord, that you would show us the error of our ways in our relationship with our spouse, in our relationship with our kids. And Lord, for those of us that don't have any, that you'd give us a fire to pour into, um, and pour into other marriages, to pour into um, other children um, in our community. And Lord, we pray that this would, this, this would turn in our community. We look at the statistics and our hearts break. Lord, I pray that you, would, that you would even change our government. Lord, that the policies that are written that encourage single family households. Lord, I believe they're demonic. God, help us to have lawmakers that will see the truth that will make decisions that will support families. Lord, we see over and over again in the statistics that even the kids with bad fathers, even the kids with bad fathers do better with the, than the kids with no fathers. But God, we want to see biblical fathers, biblical mothers. We want to see children treating each other like the Bible would have us treat each other. Lord, we want to be done with Cain's and Abel's. Or just canes, I guess. Lord, that we would be a people that would be our brother's keeper. That would be our sister's keeper. That we would be a people that would lift each other up when they're down. Lord, we would be a people that would seek restoration in the marriages around us instead of siding, siding with one side or the other, blaming one side or the other, demonizing one side or the other, encouraging people to separate. God, we come against the lie of the enemy that children should come first because they shouldn't. You come first. You come first in everything. And our spouse comes second, and the children come third. Lord, help us to spread that truth throughout the world that we might see things in the proper light. And Lord, for anyone here that is just feeling like a failure today in anything, they feel lost today, they feel broken today. If there's anyone here feeling that way, help them to know that Jesus, 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 gave us a second chance, that he's still giving second chances today. Lord, if they're feeling that way, if they're feeling like a failure in their marriage or with their kids or they're just feeling like a failure in life, God, that they would turn to you right now, that they would repent, that they would decide to go in a different direction, and that they would believe that you really did die for them, that you really did go to the cross for them, that you really were raised again on the third day for them. God, if we will repent and believe, everything can be made new. A marriage can be restored, children can be made well, and our world can be healed by the power of Jesus' name. So we thank you. We thank you for the blood poured out for us. It covers a multitude of sins. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.